Hello, I am Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba, and this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science, uh, Lecture 1. What is an experiment? So, before we go for what is an the, the outline for this course uh, covers the following topics. First, we're going to have a discussion about what is science, and then after that, we will discuss inside science, what is an experiment? the characteristics that make a good experiment and some good practice to guarantee that your experiment is useful and scientific. And finally, I will describe uh, the report number one in a little bit more detail. So let's get going. Well, all of you are masters, well, the students that are registered for this course are master's students. So you are being trained to be scientists. So what is science for you? Pause the video for a little bit, think for maybe five minutes, 10 minutes or so, and write down an answer. What do you think is science? What do you think is your role as a scientist? Okay. Um, well, there is no one answer, okay? Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, here are some answers that students from the past year gave that I, th I think were very uh, insightful. For instance, many of students usually when they ask what is science, they say, oh, this is how we learn about the world. Uh, this is how we get new knowledge, how this is we learn new facts. And that's, uh, that's a very good way to see about it. You use science as a method to learn things that you don't know, to learn about things that you don't know. Another point to that is sometimes science is not to learn about new things, but to understand what you don't know. By carefully thinking about what you know, and by being really honest about which facts you have and which facts you don't have, you cannot also understand what you don't know. There is this great book uh, of scientific variation called you have, uh, We Have No Idea that talks only about what are things that science still does not know? And it's a fantastic book. It's a book by uh, Jorge Shaher Chen and Daniel, I uh, forget his last name, but uh, it's the two guys who do PhD comics. Highly recommend that book. Other people, uh, they, take, they take one step back and they say that science is a method to reach the truth, which is an interesting take. And I think definitely we can learn a lot of about what is truth and what is not truth uh, by using scientific experiments. Uh, but of course, uh, there are many truths that are not directly observable by the scientific method. For instance, if I tell you I love chocolate, how do you prove that scientifically? Right? So that shows a little bit of the limitations of what we can do and what we cannot do by using the scientific methodologies that we are going to discuss uh, on this um, on this course okay uh, and then uh, one new student that uh, one or two years ago said something that i found really interesting science is useful when it contributes to society uh, now this is a point that is not exactly a definition of science but it's a way to think that if we're doing a study that does not give back to society in some form, then what is it useful for? And I think that is a question that is worth thinking a little bit about. So if we think like, okay, what about pure science? Does pure science contribute to society? Well, you could say that yes, because uh, applied science is based on pure science. But we can also think about a part of the pure science like that does not contribute to society. For instance, there are thousands and thousands of papers published to archive every week. What the, is every one of those papers useful? Does every one of those papers need to be useful? Is, it, is there a useful, is there use in science besides the product? Like if I make, if I study, I learn a lot and I make a scientific discovery, is the scientific discovery the only thing that is useful about science or is the process also useful for some reason? 
that's the thing that I talked about in the last video. Maybe you remember about it. Like when you know the process of science, uh, you are better equipped to separate what is truth from what is not supported by facts. So that may be something that is useful as well about the scientific, uh, the, the scientific process. And there are some, some students that oh, science is how we develop new technologies. And that's a quite interesting point. Uh, I think a lot of people have this image of science and say, oh, this is an iPhone, this is science, or this is a car, uh, this is science, or this is a rocket and this is science. And that's a point that is very common, but I think it might be a vision that is a little bit too narrow. Well, um, as I said, there is no one answer. Science is something that is very, very um, tied to, your society, to our society right now. So I think the best way to understand, to have an idea of what is science and what it's useful, is maybe to look at the lives of some scientists and to look at some scientific discoveries. Uh, we're gonna do this a little bit every uh, week. Today, I would like to talk about one of my uh, favorite uh, scientists. Uh, Marie Curie, or Maria Slovoska, as she was born. Uh, Marie Curie, uh, as she's better known, she is a Polish scientist that lived a long part, a long, a, a long part of her life in France, uh, from 1867 to 1934. Uh, she is a physicist and chemist. Uh, she is better known for being one of the pioneers of radioactivity. So she was the person who actually uh, dev devised the name uh, radioactivity. She is known also to be the first woman to win the Nobel Prize and also the first person to win the Nobel Prize two times. And that's pretty impressive. She won the Nobel Prize in physics and chemistry, both times related to her discoveries on radioactivity. Now, uh, as I said before, Marie Curie was born in Poland and she could not initially, when she was in Poland, she could not um, register, uh, um, enroll in a regular university because the universities in Poland, they did not allow uh, women and in many countries uh, in Europe in that, in that area, in that, uh, in that age. So she got educated at, and this is a really cool name, she was educated at the Flying University. And it's called that because it was not like a regular, it was clandestine. I'm not, I don't know exactly how it worked, if they had like, if they mailed materials to each other or what they did. And that's something that is, that we're gonna see over and over again when we study the life of Marie Curie. She had lots of difficulties. Uh, for instance, I said that she gained her Nobel Prize. Um, the first Nobel, the prize that, the money prize that she got from the Nobel, she used to hire the, her first assistant. And, and that's something that I find like, it's, I don't think that you could not gain a novel today without already having money to have lots of assistants to, to work on the research, but it's very interesting about that. So in the beginning, she sustained herself by working as a tutor. So she taught other people, she taught, uh, she was a private tutor for, for rich families. And she had a lot of support from her family. So in this picture that you see right now, you can see Marie and her sister. And they, so her sister went first to university, supported by Marie Curie. And Marie Curie went to the university and later and also had a lot of support from her sister. She sometimes lived at her sister's place and stuff like that. Well, she eventually moved to Paris where she did most of the research that she is famous for. Uh, she earned her physics degree at the University of Paris, and she had a very small laboratory. Her laboratory was an old shed that she got from one of her supervisors. Uh, it was shared with Pierre Curie, and as you see by the name, it, he eventually became her husband, and they met each other at this laboratory. And it's funny that both of them uh, researched uh, radioactivity. He actually, he had another topic, but he moved to this radioactivity study uh, based on uh, Marie's studies. And they were fascinated by the light of the, the light that was emitted from radioactive materials. So in one podcast that I heard about her, they were wondering if they had maybe romantic dinner lit up by radioactive, radioactive rocks. That's uh, kind of a scary 
and nice image at the same time. Anyway, both of them have a lot of difficulty acquiring funding. So, and so as I said before, her first uh, assistant was hired using the money from the Nobel Prize. And Marie found out, and one of her first breakthroughs is that she found out that the emission of radiation from uranium depended only on the size of the sample. So many people were studying radioactive materials at that time, but some of those thought that, oh, maybe the, radio the radioactivity, like the, the uranium absorbed some energy from somewhere and then emitted it, or maybe uranium absorbed, uh, maybe it was a property of how old the rock was or something like that. And one of the breakthroughs of Marie Curie is that she did an experiment that she measured the radioactivity from the uranium rocks. And she did this measure on many different parameters. So if the rock was covered, if it was not, if it was mixed of other things. And she found that the main, the only thing that depended on the amount of the radiation was the size of the sample. More uranium, more radiation. Less uranium, less radiation. And this indicated that radiation was a property of the material itself. It was not something that the material acquired, it was an innate property of the material. So that was one of her breakthroughs, okay? Uh, one thing that was really cool about Marie Curie is that she did not patent her techniques for studying radioactive materials. Why is that? Because in her opinion, by not patenting her, her techniques, people could use her techniques and science would progress faster. So even in the 19th century, Maria Curie was there being one of the pioneers of open science. Congratulations, that's fantastic. Well, Marie Curie was not only like a theoretical scientist, she also used her uh, findings in uh, radioactivity for, uh, for practical applications. So one of her observations was that uh, radioactivity was uh, known to cause damage to living tissue. And she observed that tumoral cells, cells that were extracted from human tumors, they died more quickly to radiation exposure than healthy cells. So today we had radiotherapy and one of the predecessors to the radiotherapy that we have today for cancer is the discoveries by Marie Curie. Also, she developed uh, mobile during the First World War. She thought she thought that okay, the, the, the soldiers that are wounded they need to uh, receive surgery as fast as possible. And one of the things that are necessary for surgeries is to do an X-ray of the soldier to see what's the internal situation of the soldier. So she designed a mobile X-ray unit that could be put on a car and could be taken to the soldiers quickly. So these X-ray units, they were called the little curies because of her. And they were used by France during the First World War to make sure that the soldiers could receive um, treatment as soon as possible. She also developed radio needles. So as I said before, she observed that radioactivity caused damage to tissue. So she used radiation to sterilize tissues that would be used in surgery. So those were called radio needles. And if you were thinking about this, she did a lot of things directly with radiation. So her death was as the death of many radiologists, many chemists of her age. She died of cancer. She died of cancer that was caused by all the, all the manipulation that she did with radioactive materials. Uh, one thing that is kind of amusing is that some of her research notebooks are still radioactives. So if you want to read the original manuscripts that Marie Curie wrote, well, you can go to her institute and to the museum that has her materials. They are in an isolated room and you have to wear radiation suits to read her research notebooks. And if that's not amazing, I, I don't know what is amazing. So... That's a little bit of Marie Curie. If you are interested, I really recommend that you learn more about her and that will give you an idea like, what is science? Well, look at what the biggest scientists do and that will give you an idea of what science.
So what about you? So this is one thing that I like to ask the students uh, when we have presential classes. Who is a scientist that inspire you? Well, you are a scientist right now. So have you ever thought, oh, this is a scientist that I'm really inspired by her, or this is someone that I think their, their discoveries are really cool. Do you know the story of your scientist? I think it's really nice. I mean, take your time after this class. Think about which scientist do you like. Write a comment on the video saying, what's the scientist that you admire and what's their story? Uh, it's important for us to know who are the other scientists. The scientists that are really famous, they usually have great stories, great things that they did. And when we know that, that motivates us to study that motivate us to do our research and to be better ourselves. So definitely take the time to figure out who are your favorite scientists. And in following classes, we'll talk more about other great scientists. For now, I would like to talk about a few more uh, scientific discoveries. So first, I would like to talk about the Big Bang Theory and the discovery of cosmic background radiation. So I think many of you are familiar with the word Big Bang Theory. And I'm not talking about that horrible, horrible TV show. No, I'm talking about the physics theory that describes uh, how uh, the universe progresses in the earliest moments of its existence. There is a lot of things that we don't know about how the universe came into being. But one thing that we do know is that the universe suffered a stage of very quick uh, expansion. This is called the inflation period of space. And we know that this happened because of the cosmic background radiation. And this is a very good example of how science and experiment works together. So many people pro, uh, propose different theories about how the universe developed. And one of these theories, the, this inflation theory, uh, described how the universe uh, increased very quickly in its first million years. And then this speed reduced to its current rate of uh, expansion. One thing that, that this theory, and this is, this is true for any good scientific theory, this theory made a prediction. This theory predicted that the energy from this inflation period was still around in the universe. And it predicted how the amount of the energy that was distributed. And you can see this wave graph that you can see. So uh, in the bottom, this is the distribution of the cosmic uh, microwave background spectrum that was expected following this uh, Big Bang Theory. And NASA, the American Space Agency, it used um, instrument, uh, our satellites to observe this cosmic, uh, this cosmic background radiation. And the story of how this cosmic background radiation was discovered is very interesting. I'm not going to go there right now, but just know that if you have an old TV that shows white noise, that white noise is the cosmic background radiation. So you can see the, back, the cosmic background radiation if you have an old TV. Anyway, what the Kobe mission found was that the cosmic background radiation the distribution of the different frequencies of the radiation, the black, bo the back black body spectrum, followed very closely the predictions made by the Big Bang Theory. And that was confirmation that the theory uh, was describing something that really happened in the universe. Because if the theory was uh, described incorrectly, then they would see a completely different distribution of those energies. So this is, uh, this, is a very, this is a very interesting way of how we can use theory, uh, experiments, collect experiments all over the world to learn more about uh, how the whole universe works. A second experiment that I want to highlight, a second scientific discovery is the discovery by Sir James Lind. He is a British scientist and he discovered that vitamin C prevents scurvy. Now, scurvy is a disease that is very common in sailors, in people that go over the sea, 
It's a disease that is caused by lack of nutrients in the body. We understand this now. And we had like some wounds in the mouth and in the face, and it led to the death of many sailors. Uh, it was called rottening. Like people believed that scurvy was caused by the body rotting. And James Lind observed, okay, that some, uh, some sailors, some boats did not suffer so much of scurvy at other boats. There was a difference. Some boats suffered a lot of scurvy. Some boats did not suffer so much scurvy. And he was suspected that maybe it was something in the food. So he wanted to do an experiment to find out what. He had an idea that because the scurvy was caused by the body hotting, then if we use something acid, the, the rot would be destroyed and the sailors would not get scurvy. So he did the following experiment. He took 12 sailors that were affected by scurvy and he divided them in six groups. And for each of these six groups, he gave identical diets from the boats, but he did a supplement. So for the first, first group, he gave cider. For the second group, vitriol. The third group, vinegar. The fourth group, seawater. The fifth group, orange and lemons. And the sixth group, tea. Of course, it's a British experiment. They have to drink tea. Anyway, he found out that the group one and group five, they had reduced their scurvy. Group one a little bit and group five a lot. It's very interesting, this experiment, because the tea that you can see here is something completely neutral. And seawater is something that's even negative. Okay, any sailor can drink seawater. So if seawater was good for scurvy, uh, then it would not be, the, it will, it, it, no one would have it. But he included this group to make sure that all sailors, they had the impression that they were taking something. So he would compare all the other groups against seawater because that was the base. That's what today, when we research medicine, today we call control. This would be the control group, the group that you did not expect anything to happen. And group five, it had this great difference. It was a red lemon. And because of this, James Lind talked to the, uh, to the British government and all the British boats, now they had to have lemons and oranges in their rations to prevent scurvy among the sailors. So today, medical research, uh, like the discovery of new medicines is, is done in a very similar way. You have a new medicine that you propose that is good for some sort of disease, and you separate into two groups. One group that will take the medicine and another group that will take nothing, or they will take a fake medicine. That is your control group. And you can see by comparing the control group with the treatment group, if the medicine has an influence or not. So both of these discoveries, they illustrate what we usually know as the scientific method, okay? The idea is that you create a hypothesis, then you gather data to test this hypothesis. The data will either confirm your hypothesis or maybe it will deny your hypothesis, reject your hypothesis. After you do that, if the data confirmed your hypothesis, then you write it out and you explain what happened. If the data reject your hypothesis, you're going to think about what happened and where your hypothesis is wrong, and you're going to start thinking again. So many of you might have heard of this scientific method, right? Hypothesis, testing, analysis, and conclusion. And well, this is not bad. This is definitely a, a, very, um, a very good way to, do, to think about scientific experiments. If we think a little bit about this though, this description of the scientific method is a little bit um, incomplete. Today we think that science is not only hypothesis, um, experiment and analysis. Let's think a little bit about it. For instance, hypothesis. Where do the hypothesis come from? Okay, where did James Lind came with the hypothesis that vitamin, that uh, acidic substances would be good for uh, scurvy? Like we said before, some people believed 
that scurvy was uh, a rotting of the body. So hypotheses, they come from what we know uh, about the world, right? We have some, let's see. Just get a pencil here. Oh, okay, I don't have a pencil here, okay. So we have some knowledge about the world. We explore and we discover the world. And we talk about people. Some hypotheses, they come from popular medicines, from traditional medicine. Some hypotheses, they come from um, study. They come from mathematics. You do a very careful analysis of mathematical theories and that creates your hypothesis. Sometimes you talk to each other people and Eureka, you have a very quick idea. So this communication is extremely important. Sometimes there is a problem that a lot of people want to solve. For instance, right now, everyone wants to find a vaccine or a, uh, or a drug to cure the COVID virus. So there's a lot of people that are proposing many different hypotheses. We had the, how do you say, we had the Avigan uh, medicine that was studied by Japan and China a few years ago. Uh, we had the, the chloroquine medicine that was really studied in Europe and in, in the Sahara. We had Donald Trump proposing that maybe if you drink um, if you if you drink disinfectant that might cure uh, COVID. Uh, anyway, so there are different ways that we come across these um, these hypotheses, and then we have, as you can see here, we have this link between hypothesis and gathering data. This is what we're talking about. Hypothesis, experiment, interpretation, hypothesis, experiment, interpretation. But you can see here that there is a connection between gathering data and interpreting data that does not go back to the hypothesis. Why is that? Well, there are many kinds of experiments. Some of experiments confirm hypothesis, but if sometimes uh, you really have no hypothesis, you have no idea, you want to do an exploratory experiment. You want to try many, many different things to see what works. So maybe that was what Marie Curie was doing when she was trying to find out uh, what would cause uranium to emit more or less radiation. Maybe in the very beginning she had no idea and she was trying maybe more materials, less materials, maybe different treatments, maybe different ways. Uh, so these are exploratory experiments. After you do a lot of exploratory experiments, you see what seems to be going on and you formulate the hypothesis and then you do confirmation experiments to test your hypothesis. So you have a cycle inside here. Okay, so you have experiments for many different ways. But not only that, as we saw when we we're talking about Marie Curie, after she did all the research in radioactive and she understands where radioactive is coming from, well, she thought, how can I use it? How can I use this to benefit society? So we have benefits and outcomes. We have the results of our experiments. They can be used to benefit society. And even then, you see that scenario back here because, okay, I found out about radioactivity. I found out that it, it can destroy tumors. But I don't know how much of it is dangerous to humans and how much is safe. So now I need to go back and do more experiments and test more hypotheses to figure out what would be a good treatment using radiation. And then after I have this, treat this treatment, I go back to this. So you see, it's not just hypothesis, experiment, congratulations, science is over. No, it's, it's a living system that goes back and forth. So that's why it's important to have to know about older scientists, to know about others, other research, other discoveries, even if they are not from your field, because you have this vision about science as a living system. Okay, and there's also the community, the scientific community. When you publish papers and reviewer number two rejects your paper, and reviewer number three gives you some very good ideas, that's also part of the scientific uh, community. Uh, the papers are reviewed, old papers are rejected, uh, new discoveries are made based on the revision of the literature. That's also part of the scientific method. Okay. <clears throat> there is a link at the end of the, the, the lecture that has a very good discussion about this. I highly recommend that you read it. Okay. Now, um, 
inside all of this, and the focus of this course is experimentation. So both in the simple definition of uh, the high school definition of science and the more interactive definition of science, experiments, they take a central role. Why is that? Experiments are how we get data about the world. How, I mean, we can do the hypothesis, we can talk to other people, but at some point, we have to go out there, look out of the window and see what are the facts. And that's how we're gonna get new knowledge. So, and to get these facts, we need to do experiments. So, but what is experiments? Is experiments just going out and collecting data? That's the focus of this lecture. I am going to stop this video right now so that you can think a little bit about it, think a little bit about science, think a little bit about science as a living uh, subject, thinking a little bit about the favorite scientists, leave your comment saying who is your favorite scientist. And in the next video, we're going to talk about what is an experiment. See you in a second.